want to talk kind of about all those things, but you know, we're in this, this beautiful gallery, so maybe take us through some of uh, the creation of this show. Um, to me, it absolutely seems like a growth and evolution, but where are you at? What are you, what are you thinking about? Uh, well, with this show, first of all, I apologize, guys, because I'm kind of in a super silly mood, so. Good, good. <laughs> no, it's going to be outstanding. You know, a couple more of these, <laughs> yeah. real stupid. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, for, for this show, you know, it, it was a little bit of a challenge because I work really large and I have, you know, to scale down and to like work thematically on paper, you know, throughout so that it had to sort of have that commonality with, within all the pieces and sort of tell this this story. So, you know, it, it, it posed a bit of a challenge, but I, you know, I definitely appreciate that aspect of it. And, you know, I think that with all the work that I do, um, you know, from, from the smallest pieces to the largest, obviously as me being the creator of it, there's a bit of me in it as far as from a personal side and a standpoint of how I'm feeling in that moment. So, you know, when Patrick and I were talking about <clears throat> doing a show, you know, I wanted to do something that, again, it felt familiar but a bit unfamiliar, you know, and sort of to explore the notion of uh, where I came from and, and, and my mentality in terms of that, that sort of career climb, you know. So memoirs of the minimum wage, you know, you're talking to a guy that, you know, had four or five jobs and then after working, you know, two of those jobs would go home, sleep for two hours, if that, and, and paint, you know, with the aspirations of growing and being and becoming the person that I am and, you know, and further beyond that. So, you know, I, I kind of tapped into a place that, again, it was, it, it, though it was a lot of hardship and hard times, you know, sort of the fantasy of it and, and, and the fantasticalness of it was what sort of pushed me through. And um, I wanted to sort of be able to bring that out and, 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 and illustrate that within the work. So I, I'm curious about the narrative for you that's running through it. I've, I have some ideas, but before that, like, what were some of the jobs that you had before you were able to just rely on the art? Man, I had every job. So, um, <laughs> so everything from uh, manager of record stores, uh, worked at, the, the, the worst job ever was the Gap. Yes. <laughs> How long did you last? I lasted two weeks. <laughs> Stole like four pairs of khakis. Uh, and then I was out. Yeah, I was out. Um, no dry stitching. But you know, I like I I I've worked shitty jobs since I was 14. You know, I lied on my application. Worked at McDonald's on was that 20? Was that uh, right on MLK? Um, right by McCormick Place, but worked there at 14 years old, you know, and <clears throat> weekends, early morning, breakfast shift, all that stuff, like, so, but throughout all of that, you know, that really helped put the battery in my back because I knew how shitty the job was and I knew that I didn't want to do this, so working drive through in the morning, I had napkins I would sketch on, you know, to fast forward <clears throat> to me being in college, uh, jobs where I was waiting tables. Um, fast forward beyond that, jobs as uh, security in clubs, you know, and I think that, you know, through all of those experiences, obviously they helped me sort of grow into, you know, who I am now. Um, but crazy story, so one night I was in LA and working at this bar, and it was a bar that, um, it was like a it was a weird sports bar where like all of the B and C list celebrities would come through there. So like, I mean, every 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 commercial actor you would know or just recognize from television would be in there. And then every Sunday there was a a celebrity hockey league. So like Cuba Gooden Jr. who played on the hockey league was in there. Like Michael Bay um, and uh, Jerry Brockheimer. Like they were playing the league, so they would be in there. Cuba found out I could paint. I was like, hey man, this is right around the time he did Norbit, the Eddie Murphy movie. Yeah. So he was like, man, you know, I got some checks coming in, I need some paintings, da 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 da. And you know, I, I, I had been in LA, but basically painting out of garages and you know, doing whatever I could to just sort of stay in that mind of, 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 of you know, as far as my creative prowess. And so ended up selling him some work. As a result, he told uh, 
Michael Beck and Jerry Brockheimer. And Jerry come in there, he's a short, you know, very like mm, you know, quiet, mousy guy. So I did like uh, a small painting for him. I gave it to him. You know, he was, you know, over. He was ecstatic. Met Michael Bay, and I did a. This is right before Transformers came. Out. And you know, he was like, "Man, do a do a do a robot. Paint him a robot." So I painted him a robot. I fucking loved it. And so he paid me for it, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Like I can, you know, it. it mm. Obviously, this was the goal all along to get paid for it. But again, to be able to, you know, sort of, not necessarily be equal or be seen as equal, but you know, to give this person whom I admire, you know, all their pursuits, to have them look at my work and be like, man, this is, you know, this is really good stuff. So that sort of changed this whole uh, dynamic in, in, in my mind as far as giving me enough, um, you know, battery or whatever in my back to kind of say that, okay, I can do it. Yeah. 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 Well, so what, what is, for you, what is some of the narrative that's running through these pieces? And also just because in the description of the show that, that you guys put out, even there's some uh, blending of the worlds between your autobiography and this fantastical reality of the fly boy that you also have been creating over years now. But, but for you, what is, what is some of the narrative that we get to see on the wall? You know, within the show, it's, it's, it's very like push and pull. So it's, it's the highs and lows. You know, I think that um, for me, you know, that's what it was. It was those great moments like I just described, and then there was those low moments where it's like, all right, I have to eat top ramen for a month because I, I don't have the money to, you know, sustain. So I think that, you know, when you talk about like sort of the mindset of those that sort of encompass that space, you know, in, in minimum wage, and you know, people that are sort of scraping and getting by, you know, I think that again, it, it is those highs and lows. It's it's those moments where you might be up fifty dollars. And it's, it's not always a monetary thing, you know, where you're, you're, you're gauging your life's happiness based on a, you know, a sort of a monetary uh, premise or a way, but, you know, you might be up a bit, so, you, you know, you feel high a bit. And then there's other times where things are challenging and you just feel like the world is just feeding you shit and throwing it at you 100 miles an hour, where, you know, you're, you're sort of back, you know, you're backpedaling and you're in a corner. And so, I, you know, to be able to sort of express a bit of that and also within that, that space where whether things are good or bad, where you sort of tend to drift and, and, and rise above that, that station sort of in your mind and say, you know, this is where I want to be. This is where I see myself being, um, you know, and, 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 and that imaginative space, you know, I mean, dude, I had, again, from more of a personal standpoint, like I had jobs where I'm a bouncer but I'm standing in the back of the club, in the back door, where nobody comes in. And <clears throat> I'm sketching, you know, on this, this little shift pad all night, you know, and in my mind, as I'm sitting facing a, and basically an alley, I'm sketching, but I, in, my, in, my, in my head, I'm like, man, I'm past this. I'm at a point where I have my own studio, I'm creating constantly, people are actually uh, appreciating the work that I create, people are, connecting with the work I create and, and, and that's where I was, you know, in those spaces. Yeah. So to sort of articulate that within, you know, a lot of this work is what I, I, I aspire to do. So I, I guess for me, is that then some of the superhero aspect? I know you're a long time comic book fan um, and, and maybe that's some of the superhero aspects. For me, one of the most interesting parts of the shows are those, I, I guess as you would say, maybe down moments, but to me they seem like the more intimate or vulnerable uh, moments behind the ecstatic highs of the flyboy, you know, like like this piece um, behind us, or, or or this piece where he's being embraced by by a woman. They seem um, a more humanistic spectrum of the character that you've been working on for a long time. Do you think this is your most intimate or personal body of work up to this point? I don't miss, I don't think it's my most, but I, you know, I, again, I think it just sort of follows, again, my trajectory and my line. I, you know, I consider myself a superhero in many ways, mm -hmm. you know, um, and not sort of an, as an egotistical thing to where I'm like, yo, I'm, I'm better or I'm, I'm this or that, but just in the way that, like, I accept the burden and the, 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 the idea of being championed mm -hmm. and, like, putting even Chicago mm -hmm. on my back and saying, look, you know, to whether it's a 10 year old kid that lives in Inglewood or if it's a 50 year old man that lives in Logan Square, like 
there is sort of this other path that exists. And, you know, whether people love it or hate it, I'll, I'll take the burden of the, you know, the burden of the burden for that and I'll put it on my back. I'll create, I'll put myself out there and, you know, let it be digested by the public, you know, whether for, for, for good or ill. But I consider myself sort of in that space and, you know, growing up, appreciating and having a very strong affinity for, uh, you know, uh, graphic novels and, and, and comics, cartoons, and just strong narratives where, you know, you have sort of leading male, leading female roles. The idea of what exists beyond that point of, of where you see them always being strong, where you see them always being on point, where you see them always going against the, 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 the opposing forces, the idea of what, what that looks like, what that space is when, when, when they're at their low. Like, who do they go to? What, 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 what do they feel? You know, it's gotta be hard as shit. Mm -hmm. You know, um, not to get too geeky or too nerdy, but you look at like characters and narratives, like even like Spider-Man. You know, this is a kid who doesn't want anybody to know who he is. Um, you know, he's fighting all this shit going on. He's trying to balance college, a career, a girlfriend, a this, a that, his, his aunt, this, that, and the third. But yet still picks up the mantle and is like, yo, I'm gonna go out there because if I don't do it, who will? Yeah. You know, I, there, there's, there's those that count on me. So, you know, not to say I'm Spider-Man, but I, I wish I could. <laughs> At what point is is the is this character a stand-in for you, and what point do you deviate from your own history? I mean, what part is invention, and what part are you? You know, even some of the characters in here are these people from your lives, uh, from your life, or is this instances, you know, in your life, or is it is it is it a mix? I think it's a mix of both. I mean, you know, um, as a painter, you know, you, you spend a lot of time sort of in solitude, so. When people, you know, friends of mine or, or I, you know, people come by the studio, I've learned to be a good listener. And, you know, it's almost like, and, and those that have come by the studio can kind of tell you, you know, I've had people come by, I'm, I'm working the whole time, but it's almost like a therapy session, you know, where I, there's no judgment, there, there might not even be that much of an exchange, but people unload for some reason or another, and that, you know, sort of a session of them unloading always sort of manifest into a lot of the work, you know, where it's like, again, there's no judgment. There's like, I'm not saying, you know, you should do this, you should do that, or, you know, this is one way or the next, but I think it, it inherently, you know, works its way into the work. You charge them. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but that is art therapy in a different way. Um, I guess, um, you know, I don't know if everybody knows the story of, of the character, the, you know, a lot of the main character, uh, one of the main characters in your work, the Flyboy. Um, so I, I know you've, you've talked about this a bunch, but just, you know, maybe a, a brief reiteration for folks that might not be aware of the origin story for you, for the character. Um, and then I want to talk a little about some of the new, maybe, techniques that I see, at least in, in, in the paintings themselves. Well, the Flyboy sort of arrived from uh, a void of, um of culture, sort of within the, you know, within the, the pop space, you know, um, there were different things that existed and have existed throughout, you know, years where, you know, you have Mickey Mouse, you have Bugs Bunny, you've got a fucking sponge that, you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, but when it came to, you know, I mean, like, the, the most you have as far as, like, a culturally challenging character is fucking Dora the Explorer. So there wasn't much, there wasn't much that existed in that space that was relatable, not only to myself, but, you know, generations before and after myself. So, yeah, I looked through, you know, his history and sort of landed on the Tuskegee Airmen, who were, you know, World War II Battalion, all African-American, uh, soldiers that you know flew, uh, you know these fighter planes and were, were successful in, in, the, in the limited missions they ran. But to me, the, the fact that given the time frame they existed in and, and what they were charged with doing was very powerful in and of itself. So I, I sort of borrowed from that and, and, and arrived at the, 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 the idea of the flyboy, but not necessarily as sort of one individual, but more as an idea, again, like, <clears throat> to create a sense of iconography. So, again, you know, I say this all the time, but, 
you know, much as when you see the cow and the cape, you see Batman, or when you, you know, you put a towel on your back as a kid, you embody your Superman, you're powerful. So, you know, these yellow goggles that sort of exist throughout and you see them on different characters, it's not to say that like, okay, this is just one iteration of this character that's multiplied, but more so just as an idea uh, of that sort of character and of that change and of that sort of that cultural existence, um, you know, for this character that it sort of exists, not necessarily, again, one definitive design and, you know, this is Bugs Bunny, this is, you know, this is exactly how it's drawn, this is how fucking you draw Mickey Mouse, da 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 but, again, to sort of... Well, know, they're fly, they're they're fly girls, right? Yeah, there's, 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 yeah, there's, yeah. there's many, many kind of characteristics. Um, I guess in that note, in terms of iconography and, and maybe where you're drawing some of your influences from, even in the description you mentioned Cause and Keith Haring uh, and other artists. So, you know, later I'm going to ask you your top five. But um, who are some of the folks that, you know, maybe either, you know, from uh, comic book character sketches to, you know, contemporary painters, where are you drawing some of that? inspiration and, and, and particularly around the icon, I mean, that seems like not only is a, you know, coming from the comic book and, but also like the street uh, art graffiti world as well to have a, you know, I mean, we see like in Chicago now, like J.C. Rivera's bear is very prominent, you know, and he's taking that from, uh, you know, you know, how folks have always innovated characters as a, as a little mark on the street, sure. you know. Well, I mean, for me, it's a little different because you know, my first love, even before art, is film. And so, for me, it was growing up watching Star Wars, growing up watching Muppets, growing up to even earlier memories of watching Sesame Street, you know, Jim Henson, and these men that were very successful in creating these worlds and these characters that are so iconic that they bridge cultural boundaries, they bridge, you know, just, I mean, you, Sesame Street's on in how many languages, you know what I mean? And how many people all over the world know Star Wars and things like that. So to me, that was uh, sort of the genesis of you know, my thinking when it came to creation and creating something that, again, had that sense of iconography. And then also, on a smaller scale, looking at um, like Sunday morning cartoon, or Sunday morning, a Sunday, Sunday uh, paper, you know, or, yeah, cartoons, funny, so, yeah. like Calvin and Hobbes, Family Circus, yeah. where, again, you can take these characters and, you know, though you've taken them on a thousand different adventures, you can say whatever the hell you want to say with these characters and use them sort of as a conduit for, you know, a voice for, for this person, this person, this person. So, mm -hmm. you know, these are all the things that I, I really appreciated growing up, and I think I, I, I arrived at you know, this as a result of, of, of always appreciating that. And, you know, <clears throat> I think that, you know, for me, even growing up, you know, I went to a school where, you know, from K through eighth, where half the school, you know, spoke another language. You know, it was just a multicultural school, but the, again, the commonality that we all had and the, the, the way that we all communicated was through television or film or, or, or cartoons and it was like, you know, they might not be able to speak any English or they have broken English, but they can regurgitate the lines from South Park or this, that, and the third. And, you know, I always found that to be extremely interesting and, and also extremely powerful that something like that, that can also be very dismissed, you know, in the way of, oh, it's just entertainment or it's just this, but something like that that has enough power that can also teach these kids language. Now, language might not always be good language, right. but it can still, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, it's a, yeah. it's a vehicle. Yeah. So, you know, I think that's sort of where I arrived. And, and, you know, from my earlier roots as, or in graffiti culture, in street art culture, I was always drawn to sort of the character. I think with traditional graffiti culture, you're dealing with like, you know, heavy stylings, you know, wild styles and words that, sometimes are very hard to sort of break down and, and understand what they say. But for me, it was more about the character because I felt like, you know, when you're looking at these long pieces and these long memorandums, that 
you know, I don't know what the hell that says, I don't know what the hell that says, but that's dope. You know what I mean? That character helps push all of that or, or, or gel all of that together. So that was always where I landed, you know, in that culture. And then I think that as time grew on, I became a bit more uh, intrigued with high art and things like that. So I pushed past just traditional graffiti and then, you know, on to the next. Yeah. So you said one of the things that's new for you in the show is the scale. It's a little smaller than you're used to working. What what else is for you are you doing that feels new or that is just actually, you know, fresh or, or, or some of the challenges I'm putting? Well, I think that now that I have a bit of a name, I can stop being so much of a punk and like, you know, I do a ton of work, you know, I, I'm six, seven pieces a week type of thing. and. You know, a lot of the work gets shelved, or you know, if it's a again a, a small graphite piece that <clears throat> you know takes me half the time it takes me to do a painting. But again, you know, that wasn't something that my audience was sort of used to seeing, so that got shelved or that got sort of pushed to the back. And I think for you know for this piece, and I say piece as a collective as far as the show. I, I wanted to sort of show and, and open up all of that and you know just because I think that again as far as, a, as pushing a narrative there's there's a lot of you know connectivity to to the work and you know just as I've spent a lot of time say on this piece you know that doesn't necessarily take away or negate the, 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 the quality or you know the, 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 the sort of the language in this so um, you know that, that was a big thing you know um, sort of just kind of drinking a lot of fuck it in the morning, you know, just, and, 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 and just putting it out, you know. Just, yeah. So you know, it's like, all right, people already like me, so you know, maybe I am not too bad. Fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess a few things about about this that that it feels new to me at least is um, just some of the solid color. Um, you know, I mean. You know, I think we're used to seeing a lot of color and also a lot of black and white in mix, but like these blocks of red on this wall or some of the, you know, kind of the, the, these few pieces in particular, they feel, I don't know, they feel like, in, particularly the way that the show is curated and laid out, but they, they pop and they feel bright. Um, is that, yeah, how, how does that happen for well, you? Well, color, color is very important, you know, as far as setting tone and, and, and mood. And so, you know, when you look at, the work sort of as it flows throughout the show, yeah. where you sort of start with these two works, you know, the the, the, the tone is, is is a little lower. You know, you sort of it, it's not as vibrant, it's not as popping, and, and you sort of feel that tone that you know the tonality in it is you know almost very somber mm -hmm. in essence. And yeah. again, to sort of take you through that that mindset of like you know. Obviously, there's a, a a character sort of inhabiting this this broken down plane, but then you know, either before or after after all of that, you know, this idea of like having something new, having something, you know, that you really hold on to, that you really appreciate, you really have a tight affinity for, but then after that, it sort of wavers, and then that thing becomes old, it becomes withered, it becomes you know just an afterthought. So, you know, I think that as we grow, everyone inevitably has that thing. So, you know, starting there, using that as a jump off point and then, you know, going along and, you know, you have pieces like the two behind you where it's, it's, it's sort of a journey through. Mm -hmm. Whatever that mm -hmm. through is, mm -hmm. it's a journey through. So, in those journeys, you know, they can be more fantastical. They can be more of a, an experience where Again, it's it's almost like a clusterfuck. It's like holy shit! Like I came through all of that. And like you know, it's it's almost that sort of retrospective where you're looking back, saying, "Damn, I just made it through all of that," and patting yourself on the back because of how phenomenal you know that struggle, that thing, like, might be. right? Yeah. So to give that a bit more tooth and to give that a bit more color and a bit more life to it, because again, that's sort of things that we face and you know carry throughout. And you know, for me, I'm I'm an Aries, so I'm passionate all the time and obviously red sort of symbolizes and embodies that so you know for those two pieces um, when you're dealing with just large blocks of color 
you know, again, to embody that, you know, it's red, it's passion. And, you know, you go from this character with uh, the broken arm and, and, and that, that one single match, yeah. you know, you're talking about perseverance. You're talking about actually, you know, going through it and, and making it through it. Like, you know, just by any means, you know, I'm gonna fucking do it. You know, no matter how much shit is thrown, no matter how much animosity or adversity I face, I'm gonna make it through it. And, and again, that, that embodies that passion. And then you have that other character that sort of has that bravado of like, I made it through it. Yeah. This is me making it, have made it through it. Now this is, this is who I am. This is, you know, what it is. The champ is here. So, and, and, I, and I, that piece really resonates. That's also the print that you guys made for, the, for this show. Um, and I think there's still a few prints available. Um, <coughs> seven left. Seven left. All right. So, so yeah. Not bad. Four, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also stop sleeping. But um, the, I think one of the things that I've, I've also not seen before is the inclusion of the Red X, um, you know, that are on buildings in this city. I think they stopped actually putting uh, the Red X on buildings, um, but it's... Uh, you know, it's used to say to the fire department, um, these are not how, basically these are houses to let burn if there's a fire. Um, and of course, you know, the nature of segregation in Chicago is such where you see these buildings particularly littered through, uh, you know, a deflated housing market on the west and south sides of the city. And so I'm just wondering about the inclusion of the X. Um, I, I think, I, again, I think it's an, a brilliant inclusion. Not only does it tie it to this city, it also references in some ways New Orleans. Um, you know, post Katrina, but for you, like, what is? I mean, it's it's really okay. right along Very with good. what you're talking about. I mean, it's it, it is a part of that, you know. And again, it's you know that sort of struggle, all encompassing, you know. And it's again, it's behind the north, south, right. side, and, you know. But it is a part of that makeup, that part of everything that he's kind of passed through or we passed through. It's, it's still there. It's still exists. So good. So I, I guess, you know, the, the, this character is meant, and I guess this is how maybe comics work or superheroes work, for people to see themselves in it. There's a universality to the, to the superhero, right? So we could all person, we could all aspire to our own sure. grandness, our own greatness. Sure. I mean, you know, look at what, what are the, the top grossing movies right now, you know? I mean, either it's the hero or the anti-hero, you know, um, has replaced so much of what was and now is what is, you know, you're looking at what the next thing Marvel does or DC and things like that because there is a connectivity to it, you know, when <clears throat> the other day I was downtown and just on a whim, I was like, all right, I'll stop by the comic book store and walking in the store, I didn't want anything, just kind of one of those things, you know, you just feel it out, but walking in the store, there were 10 year old black kids, right? There was a 50 plus year old like German man, broken English, asking about like a comic. There was like a 40 something year old black woman and her friend buying little figurines for themselves. Not like this is a gift for, but again, you know, everyone has that, you know, it's just like in life when you look at sports figures or political figures, like, that relatability, you know, everyone sort of has that person that they can, they can, you know, find the piece of themselves in, and you know, it's no different when you, when you talk about it, you deal with, you know, comics, graphic novels, or, or, or sort of these iconic pop, you know, figures. I mean, mm -hmm. again, like looking at Star Wars, looking at, you know, that whole sort of canon of of, of, of different characters that have been created that you know, everyone sort of gravitates to and finds something in that why they connect with it. And you recently put and put out a book of, of the character, primarily images of the, of the character, paintings of the character, and will drift away. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still some books available on your site? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you guys, so this is also, I mean, this show, it, it, you're in quite a moment, right, of, of production. You stay making paintings, but also, this book, um, and will drift away, available on the website. This giant mural now, Roosevelt in Wabash. Um, why, why the book now? And, and, and I mean, this is your first solo art book, right? Well, with the book, I, I played around with the idea of doing one for years, and you know, it wasn't until certain people were like, "Dude, you have more than enough work. Yeah, put out a damn book." You know, and I'm a huge fan of art books. You know, like. I'm the guy that's on eBay all night. Like, oh, where is this? Can I get this for? Oh, 150 dollars. Uh, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so you know, I appreciate that, and I think that again, that's sort of you know a way of cataloging 
enough work, you know, using these characters that, again, it's, it's hard for people, you know, I'm in my head all day. I know the end game with these characters. I know where I'm, I'm taking them. Mm -hmm. But to get everyone else to understand that, that's a, that's, you know, that's a, that's a harder ask. And so I felt as though I had amassed enough work that you can see these characters exist over a period of time and in different stylings and in different tonality to where, okay, I, 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 I might really respect or understand or have a strong affinity for this style or this style, but again, you get to see them you know, in, in, a, in a broader sense. And so you know, that was sort of the goal with the book. And again, like, I'm in the lab, man. I'm like Quasimodo in the clock tower. Like, I don't, you know, I'm just yeah. focused. And so I don't really pay attention to the, the volume of work, but putting this book together really sort of made me stand back and see like, damn, I, I got a couple, a couple paintings. Yeah. I got a couple pieces. So, you know, it, it, it allowed for me to, you know, show some of my more favorite pieces and then shit that I really don't like, but other people like. And, just make something fun, you know, and and again, I think that you know people respond to the the, the language of the work so well and, 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 and the aesthetic. So why not? It's about time. Well, so that being said, two more questions, and then maybe we could open it up a little bit. But also, too, sidebar, you know, Kevin, you know, he put out you know, yeah. how many books is this now? You know? I got some books. Couple, couple, right? So, you know, it was like, all right, well, you know. No, that was a good book. I got a, yeah. You know. Hebrew, Hebrew, Hebrew was kind enough to give, um, we, we just put out a book called The Breakbeat Poets, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop. Um, my co-editor, Nate Marshall, is in the back. Um, and it's, yeah, that was so Nate. Um, Nate's bald. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, we it's 78 poets from around the country, um, four generations of hip hop practitioners wrestling with the aesthetic on the page. And um, once I saw that series um, in your studio, Hebrew was kind enough to give us cover art for the book, which uh, is universally praised. And thank you for your right 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 right. So you can cop one afterwards as well. Both time for you too. Word. Um, so I guess you know, just if. So you know, obviously we can see some of the dates on some of these on um, some of these pieces. What are you working on now, and what are you excited about working on? Um, the work now is just a, a larger glimpse into the world. You know, I'm I'm a firm believer as far as you know. With this space, it's it's, it's intimate, and I appreciate the intimacy of it. And so I can you know do something like this where, in my mind, this is a storybook. You know, you're flipping through these pages and you're getting these narratives as you kind of follow along the walls. But what I want to do is, again, to sort of open that gaze up into a, the world as I see it. You know, again, I can't make someone else see it until I, I physically put it out there, but open that up. So if that means, you know, a larger showing with more sculptures, you know, a larger installation, larger works, and that's pretty much what I've been working on. So, a lot of heavy shit, man. You know, uh, very, very involved as far as you know, uh, sculpturally as well too. Because I, I, you know, I think that when you when you do three dimension, again, that that making it tangible, making it like you know, bringing it off the page or off the canvas, you know, again, reinforces how real it is, the severity of it. And, you know, and engages the audience further to where, you know, this is great, this is cool, but holy shit, this is in my face. Oh, yeah. It's towering over me. So, again, creating my world and, and bringing the audience into that world, much like, uh, you know, a film world mm -hmm. in that way. So that's, that's sort of the next wave um, and, and what I'm working on right now. This show is up through the end of the month, so make sure you tell folks about it, right? Make sure you cop the book online um, on HebrewBrantley.com. That's uh, H E B R U B R A N T L E Y. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go to the shop, click, yes, I want the book. Credit card number, boom, and then we'll get it out to you. That's how e commerce works, so thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, and there's also, there's prints, uh, there's prints available and a few pieces left in the show. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I want to end on this and then open it up. And I, I, I told you I was going to ask you this. And again, the thing about this question is this. And I, I'm, you know, I could damn near ask everybody in the room. I love the question. But uh, top five artists, dead or alive. The great thing about the question is that 10 minutes from now, you could change your ideas totally. Um, and they don't have to just be, you know, painterly folks. But uh, yeah, top five for you, um, dead or alive. Top five spans over artists. So yeah. Um, in no specific order. Um, so Todd McFarlane, who was the creator of Spawn and to Spider-Man, sort of changed the way that that was seen. Um, John Michel Basquiat. Yeah. That was my introduction into high art. Um, how old? How old were you? Doing? I was about twelve years old. Okay. And I remember because my mother was so adamant about. You know, I'm, I'm fanatical. So like, I was comic books all day. I'm at the dinner table. So mom, you know, Captain America, basically, it's crazy, this whole <laughs> arc that's happening. Because you know, now they're playing. So she's like, you know what, shut up. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing about fucking Spider-Man and Captain America. Read this art book, you know, learn about what else exists out there. So it was around then where she got me, it was a small book about pop art. Mm -hmm. And you know. Oh, you gravitated specifically towards Boston. Well, because, and I think a lot of younger people, especially African Americans, land on Basquiat the way Basquiat landed on Picasso because of this sort of primitive styling that exists where you feel as though you connect with it in a weird way because you feel like, I could do that. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, he made it doing that? Man, I could do that shit. But not necessarily understanding like the, the, the layers of, of, of just, you know, all yeah. that richness that he put in it and the, the subtext of all the work, not necessarily understanding all of that upon first or second glance, yeah. but you're like, I can do that. And so that's sort of where I landed and then, you know, grew to understand and, and grew beyond that. But I, you know, it's, it's again, it's much in the way he landed on Picasso and then became the same role in Jean Michel. Um, two. So that's two. Uh, <laughs> so, Artists, artists in my mind. So uh, George Lucas, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a fanboy forever in a day. So Star Wars is the greatest shit. Even you know, we've had conversations, yeah. but you know, I, I, I'll even go as far as to say, though I don't love my rock with the, the last three. Okay, you know, right. people might crucify me for yeah. that. Are you excited for the next? I'm super yeah. excited. Yeah. Yeah. Super excited. Yeah. By the way, I had the biggest geek out moment. You know, having. George Lucas come by the studio <laughs> and like buy work and be a fan. Yeah. To the point where you know, and I don't get starstruck, but to the point where like I, I had very few words. I couldn't couldn't find my words. I couldn't talk. I couldn't tell you my name if you asked me at that point. But it was just like, dude, George Lucas is a fan of mine. Like I grew up watching Betamax tapes of yeah. Star Wars, <laughs> and now the dude is right yeah. next to me here. And he's like inquiring about this piece and this piece, and so it, it, it was a huge, huge moment for me. I think I didn't think that was a huge moment. Did you show you because you, some of you work in the you have the R two D two head cover? That's what got him by the studio. Yeah, that's what got him by the studio. Did he cop that? He didn't because George has a very strict policy of no Star Wars in the house. Okay. Oh wow. So. Um, Though he appreciated it, he really liked it, but he has that, I mean, I'm sure, he like, I, I would be sick of Star Wars if I was yeah. like, like, You know, I'm so tired of seeing this, so, but, you know, he, yeah, he, he, he grabbed, he really loved the characters, he loved the flyboy, he loved the statues, so he, 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 he left with a nice amount of work, man, I was really surprised, and, I mean, shit, I would have given it to him for free. Yeah, you really? Know, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could afford it, I'm just going to put it out there. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so what was that, three? Yeah. That was three. Um, I'm gonna switch genres okay. from the aesthetic to uh, music, but just in the fact that, again, he's homegrown, uh, what he's accomplished and who he was and is in a way is, I say Kanye West. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's very motivational. And again, for me, uh, doing something that is, uh, you know, sort of, just me existing and creating, you know, listening to the music has definitely, definitely inspired. 
Um, does he have your work? He does. It. Kanye doesn't really collect art. Man. Okay. You know, if he, if Jesus told Kanye that the art was cool, <laughs> then Kanye would collect art. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so what was that? That's four. That's four. Yeah. Yeah. So many more, man. Yeah. Right. Just one. All right. So I think in in the vein mm -hmm. of. Uh, just creation and creating sort of a, an entire genre of art. I have to kind of be corny and just say Warhol. Um, just because, man, you know, you just appreciate sort of that space and, 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 and the idea of what, you know, he created. And, and so he was sort of that first person, like even right now where you have guys like Cause, you have Takashi Murakami who control their commerce, who control uh, their uh, manufacturing, their manipulation of their product. Mm -hmm. Where Warhol was at a point where he was just like, you know what, soup cans, yes. Cows, yes, this works, this. But then later on, it didn't become, you know, it became more of a marketing thing where you had these people sort of buying into Warhol, let me license this and put it out. Where you have now, again, he, he opened that space up to know that like, okay, well, I can control my work and what gets out there on a lower scale. Though people can't afford my work at this price point, mm -hmm. but I can put out coasters, I can put out t-shirts, I can put out oven mitts, I can put out all this ridiculous shit that, you know, just because someone wants to sort of buy into what I do, I can put it out there. So him sort of being the godfather of that, I, I, I would put him in that, in that, that account. So, all right, well, first of all, one time, make some noise for Hebrew Brown. Also, make some noise for Patrick. Yes. Yeah.